Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Canadian Wildlife Federation's um, event on invasive species. My name is Sarah Flynn, and I'm with the Center for Global Education, and we're located here in Edmonton, Alberta. And now we're just getting started on our event. I know a lot of people are still logging on, whether it be to our Zoom meeting here, that's the live, or joining us on the live stream through YouTube. Wherever you're joining us, we're so happy to have you with us here today. Now, whether you're in the Zoom room or you're joining us on the live stream, it is interactive. Don't worry, we have lots of chance for you to ask your questions of our guest expert, Nick Lapointe from CWF. Um, he is a, a, a senior conservation biologist um, that specializes in freshwater ecology. And I'm sure he will explain what all of those various words mean when he comes on to speak with us today. But we're so lucky to have him and we feel so great about having you here joining us today. So if you have a question, you already have some in your head about invasive species, maybe you're living in BC and it's mussels, or maybe you're living here in Alberta and um, well, I'll find out what an invasive species here in Alberta is soon enough, I think. But would there be um, fish related that, that is Nick's specialty, but I'm sure too he could speak to hogwood or some of the other sort of invasive species, whatever their dynamics are. So use your chat and you can type in a question and we have someone on the back end. Terry's joined us today in the back end and he is reading your questions and then sending them over to us here in the live meeting. So we'll be communicating back and forth. We'd love if you could say your name and where you're from and then your question. So I would type Sarah from Edmonton. How, how big can goldfishes get? And so and that would be, uh, and then we'll get it over here and I'll be able to call you by name and where are you joining us from? That would be amazing. Well, Sarah, on live stream, we have Melanie from Hazleton, British Columbia, who's here. And... Are you able to hear that, Nick? Can you hear Terry navigating I, I... our, wonderful. So he's gonna give us some of the people who are joining on the live stream. And we have <laughs> Ava who's seven and she's from Edmonton. Ava, Welcome Ava. We have Sybil Point Outdoor Education Center. I, being from Alberta, I had to Google, and that is in Ontario. Welcome, Ontario. And um, we have had, uh, we also have somebody here, uh, Mael, who's joining us from St. Albert. Wonderful. Mael, thanks for joining. So if you want your name, if you want a question said, just type it into the chat. And Terry will be able to let us know. And I'm happy to, to say, oh, Mayel has this amazing question from St. Albert. We'd love to bring in your, your questions and your comments. And, and let's hear what you're thinking about this topic today. So I am going to um, stop sharing and welcome you all officially today to our program. Uh, my name again is Sarah Flynn. And I'm from the Center for Global Education, and that's based here in Edmonton, Alberta. And we are on Treaty 6 land, which is the, the traditional territory of the um, uh, Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakoda Sioux. And we want to acknowledge all the many First Nations people who marked this land before us. Now, for all of our events, we do a land acknowledgement, and it's a part of our reconciliation process here in Canada. And I think it's important as we, we talk about um, our land and the earth and nature and our relationship to the environment, that we also think about who was here on this land before us and what does it mean to be responsible stewards of our environment. Now, I had on that opening slide, how big do you think a goldfish, like a pet goldfish that you have in your home, if you release it into the wild, into a lake, how big do you think it can get? I wonder if we have any guesses. Um, you can put in the chat what your guess is and we'll, we'll hit some of them. Terry, do we have any guesses? We do. Myel from St. Albert has guessed that they can get up to 50 centimeters. 50 centimeters. Ah. Oh. How any other, let's uh, see if I, I can open my chat here as well. Oh. Uh, and we also have a special shout out to uh, uh, Ms. Ezard's uh, class from Kelowna. Mm, for the whole welcome. class who's here. Woohoo, good to have you guys. Mr. Ezard. Well, so uh, we're, our going is 50 centimeters. Now, Nick, do you know how big goldfish can get in the wild? Uh, 50 centimeters is a pretty good guess. Uh, uh -huh. And I see a guess on there of six pounds. It's maybe a little bit bigger than they've been seen. 
um, but they can get to be several pounds or a couple of kilograms, uh, maybe four or five pounds, and uh, 50 or 60 centimeters would be a, a very, very big goldfish. Like uh, but when you see them, about a foot and a half, that would be about as big right. as they would get. Um, but it is pretty common to find them in the wild where they've been introduced, including where I was doing the research that I'll talk about today, uh, you know, at around a foot or a kilogram in size. Um, the really interesting thing about these goldfish, though, is that when they get released in the wild and they start breeding with other goldfish, most of them lose that orange color and the offspring end up brown and they look a lot more like common carp. So you might have seen a goldfish in the wild, uh, but not realize that you were looking at a goldfish because it's, it's just brown. Um, and part of the reason for that is the ones that are orange are a really favorite prey item for other fish and birds because they're really easy to spot. Oh, so it's not course. really a good uh, characteristic to be bright orange when you're out in the wild. Um, my favorite goldfish observation on the Potomac River was watching a bald eagle chase a pair of osprey uh, and seeing the osprey drop what it was carrying, which turned out to be a big goldfish. And uh, the eagle swooped down in midair and caught the goldfish before it what? hit the ground. So the oh. osprey saw the goldfish, the eagle saw that the, goldfish, that the osprey had the goldfish, and he wanted that snack. Wow, that's, that would have been incredible. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Nick, for coming today, and thank you for answering our question. I was, when I saw that online, I was like a huge goldfish. I was blown away, and, and to think about how these things come into our environment, because we think it, I mean, a goldfish is a part of nature. It, you know, it, it swims, it's, it's, it can, it should be able to go into the wild without any impact, but today you're going to join us to talk about these species, whether they be called alien species or invasive species, and what it means when they come into um, our environment in ways that they're not supposed to. So Nick, mm -hmm. welcome. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you study. Yeah, sounds good. So I'm a freshwater ecologist. Uh, I've uh, mostly studied fish in my uh, adult career and uh, in school after uh, in university. Uh, and I focused a lot on the conservation of freshwater fish. So I've looked at... Uh, the threats that face these fish and uh, ways to restore uh, freshwater fish habitat and populations. So wonderful. And how long have you been involved in the conservation community? Is this something you've done for your whole career or are you, um, I'd love to hear, because you are a doctor, you have your PhD in this. Mm -hmm. and, and I hated school when I was a kid. So uh, I stuck with it for a long time to, to get to that stage. Uh, but really started to like it once uh, once I got to graduate school um, after university and got to study the things that I was really interested in. Uh, so that was a big difference maker for me. I've been interested in conservation since I was a kid. I've always loved nature. I've always loved being outdoors. And I was lucky to be part of a, a kid's uh, nature club called the McCown Club. It's a junior version of the Ottawa Field Naturalist Club. When I was uh, a kid, we, I started in grade four, I think. Uh, and um, learned, you know, so much through being a part of that club about uh, how how nature works and about these conservation issues. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, probably expected to have a career in conservation from that point on. So great, because a lot of this, the, the, the youth who are joining us today are in that age range, grade two, grade three, grade four. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is open to everyone, of course, but um, we, I think that well, I'm not, uh, maybe I'll save this question to the end, but, uh, but really thinking about what can these kids do now? Because like you're saying, they could join clubs, they could do this, but what can they do now to help make a change the way you see it? But maybe we'll save that to the end because I think that's a sure. great way to leave it. So um, would you like to tell us more about steelhead trout? Uh, well, today I'm gonna or, talk about northern snakehead, I guess. Or snakehead, <laughs> sorry. Oh. Yeah. That's all right. Uh, those steelhead trout are both a, a species at risk in some places and they're a, a non-native species in other parts of Canada. I think, it's, um, I think it's just that I'm very common with that name. And so sure. it was similar. And, <laughs> and so maybe you can tell me even like how those like we, we think that because it's in trout that it must be fine to go anywhere. It's a similar. Right. And, and that's not the case. There's actually this... Uh, really neat article about an invasion paradox where the brook trout that we have here in Eastern uh, North America 
have been introduced to the Rockies out west and are uh, an invasive species there because they're out competing the, the native cutthroat trout. Uh, but the rainbow trout that are found in the Rockies have been introduced um, in the east uh, in the, the Appalachian Mountains. And they're an invasive species there because they're out competing those brook trout. And there's a whole bunch of reasons as to why. But uh, basically what it means is that when we introduce a species to a spot where it's not native, uh, the, the consequences are, are really unpredictable. And uh, a lot of times those species can end up being pretty problematic. Now, would you like me to share your slides or would you like to share your slides? I can do that. That way I can go uh, through them. Perfect. Uh, now, so I will go to... As Nick gets started, their screen. remember everyone that if you have questions, you don't have to wait till the end. You can type them in right away so you don't forget them. And then as they fit in, I can, I can slowly interrupt or Nick will maybe take a pause to ask, um, to ask you a question or or to take questions as well. So as soon as you think of something, you type it in that chat, either on the live stream or here on the link. Off to you, Nick. Sounds good. So you can see my shared uh, presentation now? Looks Excellent. Great. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about invasive species in general and what invasion biology is as a, as a science. Uh, and then I wanna spend most of my talk talking about some of the field research I did on one particular uh, invasive species, the Northern Snakehead, um, down in, in the US uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and that's, that'll be a really great chance to show some pictures of these snakeheads and, and some of the neat things that I, I got to find out while studying them in the field. Um, so, you know, we've already talked a little bit about uh, invasive species. You know, the, the term, there's this term, there are many terms to describe invasive species. They can be called exotic species, alien species, uh, non-native or introduced species. And I think generally it's, it's accepted that not every non-native or introduced species is considered invasive. Um, some are introduced and they don't, uh, you know, tend to increase in population. They don't tend to have a big effect. You don't really notice them as a major part of the ecosystem. Um, but some of the species, and we never really know which, that are introduced take over and become super abundant and start crowding out other species or causing uh, harm to uh, human systems or, or ecosystems. Uh, and at that point, they are typically thought of as invasive species. Um, so I'm curious for everyone on the phone if uh, we've talked about uh, northern snakehead, brook trout, and rainbow trout, but whether they're fish or other fish, do people know other invasive species in their areas of Canada? Let's see. I know that uh, that mussels were something that came up, but they wouldn't be considered fish. That's right, but they're still an invasive species. And mm -hmm. in fact, zebra mussels have probably done more harm than most uh, introduced fish. So mm -hmm. fish aren't necessarily the worst invaders. There's maybe one exception to that. Um, but uh, zebra mussels are, are real ecosystem changers because of the way they take over the, the substrate, the bottom of rivers and, and lakes, and the way that they filter water. And some of those changes are beneficial, uh, but a lot of them are, are really harmful. So we have the black carp. The black carp has come up on the live stream. Yeah, uh, so that's not one that's in Canada yet or not established in Canada yet, but it's one that is threatening Canada and that's uh, in the Mississippi River system. So that's a species of, of carp, uh, which uh, like goldfish are also in the minnow family. Uh, they're very giant minnows, uh, but they've been introduced to the Mississippi River and they're moving up the Mississippi River uh, and approaching the Great Lakes. So there's a big risk that they're gonna make their way into the Great Lakes. Mm. And would it be um, weather that keeps them out? Oh, I'm sure you'll uh, get all of this in your talk. For some species <laughs> it is, yeah. And we'll talk about that for Northern Snakehead. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm, that's the extent of our guess. Ooh. Rock snot. Rock snot has been- <laughs> Rock snot. I'm trying to think if there's a picture here. there that isn't, but that is a common uh, aquatic invasive species. It's uh, commonly known as rock smot, snot, uh, which is a fun, uh, fun name for kids. It's less commonly known as didymo. Um, I don't know if uh, maybe you want to pull up a picture to show later, but basically what this is, is uh, an invasive algae 
that gets into stream systems. And it often gets transported there by uh, people that are fishing, that are wearing boots that have a bit of that on the bottom of their boot. And then they walk into a new stream several days later and they introduce it to that stream. And it basically covers all the rocks in the stream with this long strand of algae that's kind of yellow and blobbish and looks a bit like snot. And it makes it really hard to fish in that stream because your line gets tangled in it all the time. And uh, biologists sometimes spread it. So we have to be careful too. Um, it's a lot like what we're dealing with with COVID. You know, when you go to a new ecosystem, you need to be careful that you decontaminate everything and don't bring something into that new ecosystem unintentionally. Oh, that's a great analogy. And mm -hmm. Brenda has one last guess and it's that the Atlantic salmon and Pacific fish farms. Yeah, so they're, uh, again, another potential invader. Uh, we don't have a situation yet where Atlantic salmon have colonized any of the rivers in British Columbia, but that is a huge, huge risk. And we know our Pacific salmon in British Columbia are hurting right now. Their populations are low. They face a lot of threats. And the last thing they need is competition from uh, Atlantic salmon that might establish themselves in those rivers and so every atlantic salmon farm that we have on the west coast that is out in the ocean and not in a building is a, a, a tremendous risk to our wild pacific salmon hopefully that never happens yeah oh one last guess from the live stream miles said the round goby the round goby and i think do we not have a picture oh we don't have a picture of a goby right here yeah so round goby were introduced into the great lakes um, much like uh, zebra mussels through the ballast waters of ships. So they got onto the big shipping, uh, the, the huge tankers that, that pick up uh, our cargo and our trade from Europe and come all the way across the Atlantic Ocean and up into the Great Lakes. And then they changed the water in their tanks and these little tiny gobies and zebra mussels got out into the Great Lakes. In fact, about 180 species have been transferred into the Great Lakes and many of those through ballast water. Um, and so round goby are a little tiny fish that lives on the bottom of the of the lake or the river, uh, but they eat other fish eggs and become uh, really, really abundant. So not all of the invaders are big and bad, <laughs> like snakeheads or, or maybe goldfish. Uh, even small, small individuals can be a, a big problem. Interesting. All right, let's uh, let's keep going. So, um, you know, one thing about invasive species is if you've heard about environmental issues, you know, probably the first one that you've heard about is climate change as being a really hard thing that we have to deal with. And one of these things that we're looking at is maybe permanent, uh, irreversible and widespread. And invasive species are very similar to that. Um, you know, the challenge with invasive species is that we really don't have a solution. Um, if we find an invasion very early on where only a few individuals are out there, uh, we may have a chance of eradicating them, which means going out and collecting all those individuals and, and killing them or putting them in captivity, but getting them out of the environment. But once uh, a species is spread uh, over an area, you know, over several kilometers or with hundreds of individuals, we really just have to live with that new reality. And those species will, will be there for the rest of our lives. So the best thing we can do is, is minimize the way that they spread. Um, or the amount that they spread and minimize those introductions so we don't have that risk. Um, like I said before, many introduced species have, you know, no harmful effects or only minor ones, but the few that become super abundant can have uh, effects on our economy, effects on human health uh, and on ecosystems and, and on uh, biodiversity. So they can uh, outcompete with our native species, they can reduce the overall number of species uh, in an ecosystem, or they can change how that ecosystem works, like zebra mussels do. Um, in the US, this is going back about 20 years, but the cost to the American economy was estimated at $137 billion. Uh, and ways that that, an example of that is the chestnut blight, which, uh, which happened more than 100 years ago. And we used to have huge American chestnuts in the Northeast of North America. Uh, trees that were almost as big as, as the huge trees on the West Coast. Uh, but these were all wiped out by uh, a Chinese chestnut, chestnut blight that Chinese chestnut trees are resistant to, but North American ones weren't. Uh, so the species isn't, isn't extinct. You can still find little tiny chestnuts, 
But as soon as those trees get uh, of any size, they succumb to this blight. And so we've lost that huge wood resource as a result of the introduction of this blight, which is basically a tree disease. Um, the zebra mussels that I mentioned uh, really cover, create these thick mats and clog intake pipes uh, wherever we take water to, to use for, uh, for human uses. And so those pipes now have to, be got, have to be cleaned out. Grapes need to be cleaned out. We need to spend more money on that. And at the bottom here, we have a, a pretty striking invasive species, the sea lamprey, um, which are native in a lot of places and, and aren't a problem, but where they got introduced to the Great Lakes and the fish there didn't have resistance to them, uh, they became a huge problem for all the, the trout and salmon fisheries in the Great Lakes. Uh, and so now every year we spend millions of dollars controlling these sea lamprey by trying to prevent them from breeding uh, to keep their numbers down so that we can have those, uh, those fisheries in the Great Lakes. And as I mentioned earlier, this idea of, you know, introductions, most of them are, are, are fine. They don't result in any problems, but sometimes they, they don't work out the way we think. So common carp, uh, you've probably all seen common carp. They're found everywhere in Canada, almost everywhere except the far north. Uh, and this was a hugely popular fish in Europe and, and Asia, one of the most popular fish and one of the first fish that we learned how to breed in captivity and transport across the ocean. So in the late 1800s, we started introducing common carp everywhere in North America, thinking that they would be a great sport fish and a great food fish here. Well, for whatever reason, people in North America do not like common carp. We, there's a few people that do, but most people don't like to fish for them. Very, very few people like to eat them. And so they become extremely abundant. And, and not only that, but common carp have uh, a unique feeding style. They like to root around in the sediment because they like to eat insects. So they dig around in the mud to eat insects. And when they do that, they dig up all the aquatic vegetation, they stir up that mud, and they can make a lake go from, from weeds, clear and weedy, to really muddy and filled with algae. Uh, so they're real ecosystem engineers, just like zebra mussels. And they're probably the worst fish invader that we have in Canada, but they were intentionally introduced with with the goal of thinking this would be a really good resource to have in Canada. So that's, that's a, uh, an invasion that didn't work out as intended and kind of, you know, tells us what happens when we mess with nature. We experiment with nature without knowing what the consequences are going to be. So here's my friend, the Northern snakehead. I'll talk about him in, in just a minute, but I wanted to quickly talk about um, invasion biology as a science. So if you were trying to study invasive species, what kind of questions would you ask? What would you be trying to understand about them? Wow. And I mean, because I, I bet it can go the gamut from economics all the way mm -hmm. into uh, ecosystems. Absolutely. And I'm sure that, that there's, there's people who come into this from angles and studies that they never expected in terms of their, how they started in school and what they ended up doing as, as a career. Yeah, people studying math can be really helpful because they can create models of what these invasive species are going to do that will help us manage it. Uh, like you said, economists get in, engaged in this as well. So it is a very, very broad field. I would think though, uh, we have a bit, we have a 10 second delay on our, our live stream. So I'm sure. giving a little time for the question. So invasion biologists, well, because it's biology, it has to do with nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, that's right. So that part of the question of what we do about invasions, what yeah. can biologists do to help us understand and manage these? And then the word invasion makes me think um, maybe like a war or you know, <laughs> fighting and, and, you know, like trying to resist. So I, mm -hmm. I'm trying to, so yeah, I guess would, would be then more just the the biology of it or the, wow, there's a lot yeah, of so, stuff going on. Yeah, that's it. So invasion biology is really um, the study of, of non-native species in the ecosystems where they were introduced. And so the, the question that I have for everyone is what would you be studying about those species? Hmm. Good question. Well, we have some other questions coming around about how how it might, invasions might actually occur. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, so that's one of the questions. Where they that's one out. of the questions that invasion biologists ask is what are, what are the pathways? What are the vectors? 
Um, because if we understand where these species are coming from and how they're being introduced, that gives us an area where we can uh, try to prevent those invasions from occurring in the first place. So some of the most common, now I work with aquatic invasions, much more so than terrestrial. So freshwater invasions are their own type of invasion. And it's not really easy for a freshwater organism to uh, make its way to new freshwater bodies by itself because they they are limited to those lakes or those rivers. They, they can't move over land to get to them. So typically the pathways that we learn about or that we found is that uh, it's usually human activities. Uh, they can be hitchhikers like the ones that, that climbed on the ships uh, and traveled from Europe to the Great Lakes. They can be intentionally introduced by people like uh, goldfish, where people are uh, dumping them in the water because they have a pet that they don't want anymore. Um, you can have ones like northern snakeheads that are a food fish and that we think people bought in a food market to eat and then for whatever reason decided not to eat them. And so they put them in the water to, to let them go free, uh, which is a nice thing to do in theory. But the problem is it, it creates problems for many other fish other than the one you're releasing. Um, and then sometimes you have people that like to fish for species uh, that want to see that species uh, in their local lake. So they go out and find them and bring them and put them in their local lake. But again, that, that's like that Frankenstein effect. It can have a lot, have a lot of unintended consequences. Yes. An another really important um, so one for, for fish is uh, bait, bait buckets. So anyone who fishes with minnows really it's important when you're done fishing at the end of the day, don't dump those minnows into the lake because you could be introducing the species when you do that. You need to take those minnows home or, uh, or dump them in the garbage or, or put them on shore or return them to the place that you bought them. So Liam on the live stream is, is kind of said, uh, studies how to prevent or eliminate invasive species. Mayel yeah. says that she, it's uh, trying to control and again, prevent aquatic invasions. Mm -hmm. And then um, Sybild from the outdoor, uh, from the Sybild Outdoor Education Center, they're saying how species impact food webs. So there's sort of yeah. different uh, ideas about what an invasion biologist might be doing from day to day. Well, all every one of those is right. So uh, you know, we want to predict, uh, we want to prevent, we want to control if we can, and. Uh, if we need to and eradicate if we can. And so, you know, understanding what effects they're having is, is something that we want to do. We want to study the ecosystem to find out whether the species is problematic or not. We want to create ways to control or eradicate them. So this is uh, an invention uh, aspect to it. And we want to understand the ecologies. You know, what, what makes a fish or a, a species a good invader? What makes an ecosystem uh, likely to be invaded? And if we know those things, then we can predict where they're going to, uh, where these problems might occur and try to prevent them from happening in the first place. So snakeheads, I'm gonna now move into the study that I did. There are 30 yeah. species of snakeheads. Um, most of these are found in Asia, though there's three in, in Africa. Um, they're a really neat species of fish in that they breathe air. And we have a few air breathing fish in Canada, uh, both in and long nose gar. Um, but those are, are ancient fish. They're as old as the dinosaurs. This is a, a, a fairly new fish that evolved much more recently. And they breathe water, but uh, they can, you know, if they're not getting enough air out of the water enough, oxygen out of the water that they're breathing, they can go to the surface and take a gulp of air and uh, get some more oxygen that way. So they can't really live out of water. They, they can't move very well across land. They're pretty good at like slithering down the slide side of a slope to get back into the water, but they can't climb the banks to get out of the water. Um, but if they end up on land for a bit of time, as long as they're kept wet, they can survive for quite a bit of time. They just can't move around really well. So they're you know, there's a lot of uh, the media first thought that snakeheads walk on land, that they're just going to get out of one lake and walk to another one. Mm -hmm. But uh, part of the studying that we did, we realized that that isn't something that they're really able to do. So here's an example of some math that was done. Uh, some researchers uh, looked at where each of these snakehead species lives in Asia and what temperatures they can tolerate. And they found that most of those snakehead species are tropical. They can't, uh, they can't live in cold climates. They don't survive the winters. 
And so they used that to look at the climate of different parts of North America and said, where could these species uh, likely live? And if you look down at, uh, at Florida here, you can see most of these species do pretty well in Florida, Mexico, really the sort of subtropical parts of North America, uh, but can't live anywhere beyond that. So in Canada, they're not really a, a threat, except for one, and that's the northern snakehead. The northern snakehead is the one cold water, cool water uh, species of snakehead that actually would find Florida too warm. It would be unlikely to survive there, but could survive pretty much anywhere in Canada, even up into parts of the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. And that's because this species lives uh, in the northern parts of China and Russia up into Siberia. So a Siberian species is going to do pretty well in, in Canada. Uh, they're quite able to survive that. So this is, you know, that sort of predictive modeling lets us know that northern snakeheads are a threat to Canada and the other snakehead species probably are not. Can I ask you a quick question that came in? Um, yeah. With those maps, what's the difference in the biology of the fish that lets it live up north versus the other ones that live south? And like, how do they survive in those cold temperatures? What biologically, biologically is going on in them? Yeah, well, you're getting into the physiology uh, of things, um, but one of the first things that people started to do when, when uh, studying fish as a science was look at what temperatures they can tolerate. And because fish like reptiles are cold blooded, not warm blooded like we are, they can't regulate their temperatures. So they just basically exist in the environment. You know, we, we walk around at uh, 98 degrees. So we're warmer than outside when it's cold. Fish just live, you know, at whatever temperature their environment is. And um, some species of fish are warm water fish or tropical fish, and other species are cold or cool water fish. And that basically means that when they're in their preferred temperature, they have evolved to grow really well to be able to um, digest their food, put on uh, muscle mass, move around efficiently, and, and thrive in a preferred range of temperature. But no fish can, can thrive across all temperatures. So you kind of have to, you know, there, there are winners and losers, basically, and, and fish do well where they're in their, their optimal area. So all the fish in Canada have survived, have evolved to survive winter. You know, they wouldn't exist here in Canada if they couldn't survive winter. And fish get to live through winter because water doesn't freeze. All through winter, water is only about four degrees. And so even if fish don't do well in four degree water, as long as they can survive, they hang on for the winter and then do well in the summer. And this is uh, an example of a species that does really well in that northern climate, but not in a tropical climate. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're really lucky in Canada when it comes to fish. We're not susceptible to a lot of invasions of all of our aquarium fish because most of them are tropical and just can't survive the winters here. So Northern snakehead were first found in a little pond in uh, 2002 in Maryland. And this spawned a huge media, uh, you know, it was in the news everywhere. Uh, there were horror movies made about snakehead terror, thinking that these were fish that were gonna take over everything and walk on land and, you know, attack people and everything like that. And that's really not the case. This is about as big as they get. And this is a big fish. This is almost 15 pounds. Um, but, you know, they don't have bigger teeth than a, than a walleye. Uh, that's pretty common or a lake trout that's common here in, in Canada. They're pretty shy. They're not a risk to people, but they are a risk to the ecosystem. And the nice thing about being found in a small pond was that they were actually able to poison the entire pond and uh, get rid of those, those fish. But unfortunately, a couple of years later, they found northern snakeheads in a big river, the Potomac River. Um, and once a fish like this has established a breeding population out in a big open river system like that, there's really no going back. Um, there's no way to, uh, to get rid of them. So we shifted then from trying to prevent uh, their introduction to trying to understand and manage the species that was there. So for those of you who don't know where the Potomac River is, uh, it is down here near Washington, D.C. This is the river that goes right through uh, Washington, right by the Pentagon and, and the Washington Monument. Uh, and you can see it's a really wide river down here, and that's because it's pretty close to the Chesapeake Bay to the ocean. And this part of the river, until you get about to where it says Arlington there, is tidal. It's all fresh water, but the water level goes up by about three feet and down uh, three feet with every six-hour tide. 
So this is sort of where they were first detected in the wild. And really within a couple of years, they'd spread to everywhere they could within this, uh, this map. So um, we wanted to just get a basic understanding of this fish. It had never been here in North America. We didn't know what it was, what it would do, what it would eat. So we wanted to figure out, um, you know, and then whether it might compete with or eat our native species. So we wanted to find out what they eat. We want to find out where they go in the river. Do they go down deep? Do they uh, live shallow in the weeds in, in open water? Um, we want to know where they spawn because uh, every fish has a different spawning behavior. Some build nests, some lay their eggs out in the open. Um, we want to know if they move around a lot. Are they going to spread quickly? Uh, or do they stay really localized? Uh, some fish in rivers can move hundreds of kilometers and others stay within a few hundred meters. Uh, so we didn't really know anything about this fish and we wanted to learn what we could as quickly as possible to find out what this meant to have this new species in the ecosystem. So we collected fish using boat electrofishing and sometimes backpack electrofishing. And uh, this is a really neat uh, way of collecting fish. Uh, what it does is it shocks the water. And when you shock a fish, it's not like a human who gets shocked where uh, your heart might stop or you might feel a painful shock. Uh, with fish, what it does is it just stuns them. Uh, so they either go unconscious or they lose the ability to move. And because fish have a little swim bladder, they float up to the surface. And when you turn the electricity off, they wake up and they swim away. And uh, if you do it right, the, the fish are not harmed by this. So it's a really great way to go out and uh, you can shock the water, leave all the native species alone and just take the snakeheads out that you want to study. Um, that said, it's still really, really hard. Uh, if we were shocking the water and we saw a snakehead, we were lucky to get about a quarter of them in the boat. Uh, the rest all escaped. So, uh, and, and we were lucky to get two or three an hour. So we really had to put in a lot of work to collect uh, these fish. Um, and were you at risk yourself of being electroshocked? Uh, I'm trying no, to imagine so if you what look, this looks like. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> so if you look here up the top, I mean, as long as you don't touch the water, um, then you're okay. Uh, when I was running the boat, I made sure that everyone was wearing rubber boots and rubber gloves and uh -huh. that the nets that we use had a fiberglass handle. So none of that could be transmitted to us. Uh, you can see the, uh, the game wardens, the biologists that work for the States down in Virginia are a little less, uh, they're a bit more like cowboys. They're a little less safety cautious. <laughs> so they're not out there wearing any of that protective equipment. Uh, but again, as long as they don't touch the water, then it's safe. And the boats have another safety fisher feature, which is uh, a kill switch. So everyone who's on the boat is stepping on a foot pedal. And if you come off that foot pedal, the electricity stops immediately. So if you fall in the water, by the time you hit the water, the electricity will have stopped. Um, yeah. Wow. And so do you run it continuously until you have the fish that you want? Or I'm very interested. Yeah, and <laughs> That's right. So you do, I mean, you can, you uh, maybe turn it off when you're going from spot to spot, but when you're in a, a place where you're, you expect the fish to be, you turn the electricity on and run it for several minutes as you move the boat around uh, until you see a fish. And then you have to stay on that electricity until that fish is in the net. Uh, these are really tough uh, fish. They're really quick to escape. And even when you have that fish in the net, you better get it into a cooler pretty quick because they're pretty good jumpers and squirmers. And uh, it's it, a really good chance that you're going to lose it if you're not careful. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. So with some of the fish that we caught, some we dissected to see what they uh, what they were eating. But a lot of the other ones we put tags in. Uh, so we put a little radio tag in that fish and that radio tag would beep every one and a half seconds. And if you use an antenna like this and you point it, you know, if the fish was over uh, down on the bottom, right, can you guys see my mouse or do you not see my mouse moving around? You do. Okay. So, you know, there could be a fish uh, about a half a kilometer away over here. And if this biologist points the antenna at that fish, you'll get a loud beep. And if you point the antenna over here, you get a quiet beep. So it's basically like playing a game of hotter or colder. You keep pointing the antenna in different directions and wherever the beep is loudest, you go in that direction and then you scan around a little bit more. And you can, you can be very, uh, you can really z zoom in on where that fish is. Um, and so to tag these fish, we would anesthetize them. It's really doing surgery on them. Uh, you can use different chemicals to knock a fish out without hurting it or killing it. 
And while it's unconscious, you put the tag in and then you stitch uh, the fish up. And as soon as they recover, you put them back in the water and they go back and uh, resume what they were doing beforehand. Uh, and they heal up uh, really well. Again, snakeheads are a really tough fish, so they can deal with that uh, quite well. Um, here's an example of one of our fish that we ca recaptured uh, several months later. Um, sometimes uh, you'd put in, with humans, you might put in stitches that dissolve after a period of time. Uh, with fish, that tends to be problematic, so we just leave the stitches in. But you can see that that wound's closed, and this is the actual antenna that is hanging out of the fish. Uh, and that's what we're picking up the signal from. And then the transmitter is inside and it has a battery that's making it beep for a period of time. How many fish would you try to tag in an area? We tagged 50 fish. Uh, the tags are expensive. They're about $300 each. Uh, but the other problem is, you know, you have to actually go out and track all of them. So uh, if we tagged more than 50 fish, we probably wouldn't have been able to keep up and, and find all of them. Um, luckily, uh, about uh, two thirds of the fish stay in the the rough area where we where we um, left them. So they were fairly easy to track, uh, but one third of them the following spring in uh, during the mating season uh, dispersed. They took off in all directions and it took us the rest of the summer to find out where they had gone. Uh, some had traveled up to 40 kilometers further away before finding a new home and, and reestablishing themselves. Wow. So that's, that's why this species spreads a lot. Um, but this also really helped us understand uh, where they live. They don't all live in thick, thick vegetation like this, but every snakehead that we found was close to some kind of cover. They like to be able to run away and hide uh, very quickly. That, that's very much what they do. We rarely saw them out in the open. I think we ended up tracking these fish and locating them uh, over 4,000 times and probably only saw the tag fish that we were doing uh, maybe 10 times out of those 4,000. The rest of the time they were invisible and part of the reason is they go into places like this this is called spatter dock it's like a lily pad uh that is a, you know at the top of the water at high tide and just on a muddy flat at low tide and they like to go in there and catch fish um or down here you know there is just a few inches of water and somewhere a few feet in front of the boat in this basically wetland uh a snakehead went and hid there as we were tracking it so that's the kind of, of habitat they can be found in um, but many other times we were just out in, in open water in maybe two meters of water below us and they were just down near the bottom uh, in front of the boat. We also wanted to see what they were eating. Uh, we wanted to find out what time of day they fed and uh, what, you know, are they eating fish? Are they eating frogs, insects? And does that overlap with the other species in, in the river system? Are there certain fish that they eat more than others? Um, and so what we would do is uh, for native fish like largemouth bass, we could uh, do something called pulse gastric lavage. So that we basically were pumping water into their stomachs and then they would throw up all that water along with whatever was in their stomach, like this uh, half digested sunfish down here. Um, and uh, so we were doing that for the fish, you know, the non snakehead fish, because we wanted to release them alive. Uh, but snakeheads, because they were an invasive species, we weren't worried about releasing the ones unless they had a tag uh, back into the system. So we would dissect them, we'd cut open their stomachs, and while we were dissecting them, we would take other information on them. Like we would, we would measure, uh, not we wouldn't count all their eggs, but we'd measure how heavy their eggs were. We would pull this out here. This is an otolith, and this is uh, basically an ear bone for these fish. And if you look even closer than this, uh, otoliths have rings on them like a tree. So you can figure out how old that fish is by counting the rings on the otolith. So for every fish that we um, killed and dissected, we tried to get as much information from it as possible. And how long do uh, they usually live? Well, it turns out that snakehead otoliths are very difficult to read. So there is uh, a bit of debate about that. Um, they're not an extremely... Yeah, absolutely. They're not an extremely long-lived fish. Some freshwater fish can live to be 100 years old. Uh, the best we could tell is most snakeheads are under uh, 10 years old, um, but certainly four or five-year-old uh, fish, like this fish here, would be anywhere from three to five years old. So this is one of my favorite snakehead pictures. Uh, that is a pumpkin seed sunfish, which are native to Canada and native to the Potomac River. And uh, this snakehead had grabbed that sunfish, which was about as big a sunfish as it could swallow, 
and uh, was holding on to it until until it was dead. Sunfish have if you've ever if anyone's ever gone fishing for sunfish, they have a lot of spines that they use as a, a protection against predators. Uh, and snakeheads don't mind that at all. We've seen them uh, swallow these sunfish backwards and just through the their the strength of their mouth just break all those spines so they could get the sunfish down their throat. Uh, but snakeheads uh, can't bite chunks out of fish; they have to eat fish whole. Uh, and so um, this was a shocked snakehead that was holding on to its dinner uh, even after it was shocked in in our net and in the boat. Determination. So here's some of the things that they. Yeah, here's some of the things that we eat. That's the sunfish that was in its mouth. So you could see some of the teeth marks there. Uh, they do have sharp teeth. I wouldn't put my hand in a snakehead's mouth, but if I did, you know, I would get cut. I wouldn't get my hand bit off. Um, here's a goldfish that I was talking about earlier that has that uh, no longer gold, but more of a brown color. Um, they did eat some crayfish, but that was a big difference between largemouth bass uh, that have uh, a ton of crayfish in their diet. That's like half of the largemouth bass diet snakehead mostly eat um, uh, fish because they have this upturned mouth because they go up to the surface to eat, to, to breathe air. So they usually feed on fish that are, you know, in front of them or above them, whereas largemouth bass can more easily go down to the bottom and feed there. Uh, so this is a mummy chog. It's a, a species similar to a killifish that we have in Canada, uh, a black crappie that we have here as well, and a gizzard shad that's in the Great Lakes. Uh, this is a spot tail shiner, a minnow that we have everywhere in Canada, and yellow perch that are found uh, throughout much of uh, eastern North America. So these are some of their favorite uh, food items. They have a life cycle. So, uh, you know, they don't, fish don't have spring, summer, winter, and fall. They have their uh, pre-spawning season where after winter they're eating a whole lot and getting ready to, uh, to spawn. They're putting on as much weight as they can. Uh, and that's, you know, sort of April until early June. And then all summer, they're, they're digging nests, uh, guarding their nests and guarding their young uh, until about mid-September when they again go back to feeding really aggressively, trying to put on enough uh, weight to survive the winter. And then from uh, November until April and water temperatures are pretty cool, they go into sort of a, a limbo period. They don't hibernate. They will feed in the winter. They'll move around, but they are way less active during that period. Um, and again, because fish deal with temperatures, you know, the seasons are really when the water temperatures hit these thresholds, they shift from one season to another. Um, we didn't know much about where they nested. Uh, what we read about them was that they spawn, they dig a nest where they clear vegetation, uh, but also that they lay floating eggs and guard them. And that didn't make a lot of sense to us because we didn't know how you would guard floating eggs. Wouldn't those eggs just float away? So we spent all summer tracking these 50 tagged fish and, and shocking fish and so on, looking for snakehead nests and looking for something like this, you know, a cleared patch in vegetation. These are actually two snakeheads. One of them's tagged. This one over here is tagged that I sat on the rock and watched the two of them doing some kind of spawning dance, uh, circling around. They weren't spawning, but they were obviously courting, but I didn't see any sign of a nest. So we really just couldn't figure out um, where they spawn and, and they're reported to maybe spawn multiple times in a year as well. And, you know, we did see all these signs here. You can see a very fat pregnant female. She's full of eggs. Uh, you can see their cloaca, which is, uh, where they both poo and pee and reproduce out of, uh, fish and lizards and birds all have that. Um, and this is the female versus the male. So you can see that big difference. You could see the uh, the males have a lighter belly but are darker overall. You know, we got to be able to tell from looking at enough of these fish whether or not that was a male or a female without uh, cutting it open to check. We saw that the males had these big scars and it's because they're clearing that vegetation. So they don't have hands. The only way they can clear all this aquatic vegetation is by swimming aggressively against the mud or the sand and uprooting that vegetation. And it puts quite a toll on them. Uh, when they're actively digging nests like that. So the females have to put a lot of energy into producing eggs and the males have to put a lot of energy into building nests. We knew that they were spawning because we would see these females with really, you know, with developing eggs here in the middle. Uh, at the top, these are like really uh, eggs that are ready to go. This is a female that's ready to spawn. 
And down at the bottom, you could see the ovaries of a female that had already spawned. So she's gotten rid of all of her eggs. Uh, and we would see that starting in about June, um, that there'd be this big change, but we still couldn't find these nests. And finally, the last week that we were out there in August, I had to go back to start school in the fall. Um, but we were tracking one of our tagged fish and we noticed this and we noticed this little patch of yellow, uh, that looked a lot like the eggs that were in our snake heads on top of this little mat of floating vegetation, uh, on the side of a little tidal canal. And we looked a little closer at it and you know this really stands out when you see this this little pattern of eggs uh and when you zoom in on it that's the background i've been using these eggs all stick together and just sort themselves into this two-layer pattern like this uh it kind of looks like a beehive it looks a lot like a beehive and uh, it's actually really quite quite pretty uh and i wish i had a better camera uh, mm. but this was a really neat thing i ended up uh taking the first week off of school and i studied this nest for two weeks to see how it would develop so i would go back to that nest uh every day for two weeks and take pictures take notes uh, when the, the young hatched, uh, I would collect a few each day uh, so we could look at how they developed. And uh, it was a really neat way to go and observe uh, nature every day. Now, I know um, we have just six minutes left. And I know we have some questions that have come in on the live stream. But I know you only have okay. a couple slides as well. So I want to yeah. just make sure that you get your highlight points, especially on like, what is the impact of this? Sounds good. Sounds good. So, you know, um, Really what we found is we're now uh, about 15 years after that invasion and snakeheads have never become super abundant in the Potomac River. Uh, they have been one of those species, they're common, so they have become uh, you know, a significant part of that ecosystem, but we haven't lost any species because of snakeheads, because they've eaten them all or outcompeted them with them. So it really seems like in the Potomac River, this is an okay species. You know, the question is, what happens if snakeheads continue to spread? And is there another ecosystem maybe that has a small endangered minnow in it or something like that, or that doesn't have, you know, Potomac River already had 40 other introduced fish in it. So it's hard to have one new introduced species that could completely throw it uh, out of whack. Um, but it is possible that these snakeheads would be a problem if they get introduced to another area in North America. So the best thing we can do is limit their spread and, and hopefully not have them in Canada where they might have a different effect here that they had uh, down in the Potomac River. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so interesting how, I mean, and, and, and we think about all invasive species in general and how this is a model for, though you don't think that, that one or, or two or three can make a difference, that it really could have a, a huge impact on the entire ecosystem of an area that's just not ready for this animal or is, or out competes the other animals that are mm -hmm. native to the area. And it so, might or it might not, and we really don't yeah. know until it happens. So better to not experiment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, Terry, I know that you, you said there are some live stream questions rolling in. And so let's get our last few minutes here of, of answering those for our excited audience. Absolutely. So Shell Clark has a question. Do you know why there are so few fish in Alberta streams compared to 20 years ago? Uh, I guess it depends on the species. Uh, there probably um, isn't fewer fish overall, but if you're a fisherman, there might be fewer trout or target species uh, compared to before. And that could be because of harm to the habitat uh, as we you know, create parking lots and uh, and farms and so on. If we don't do that properly, it can really cause the, the habitat to change in those streams, uh, or it could be because of too much fishing. Um, so if you have a local stream that has a lower fish population, it's probably because of, of fishing or um, changes to the habitat. And we have another question here from uh, Mr. Li uh, Liam Ezard, who brought their whole class today. Uh, the question is, what are some commonly known non-aquatic invasive species? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> you you may be asking the wrong guy here, but purple loosestrife is, uh, is a common one. Uh, common reed or phragmites is another one. Uh, those are both sort of wetland uh, ones. Um, the emerald ash borer is, uh, is one and, um, that's been introduced to eastern North America. I'm trying to think out west. 
Um, I, I don't know if um, the spruce budworm outbreaks or I think mountain pine beetle, uh, if those are outbreaks of native species or uh, introduced species, but I'm sure at least one of them, Asian longhorn beetle is another one. So often a lot of the insects that have um, been introduced through packaging materials and escaped out into the wild uh, have been problematic invasive species. Mm -hmm. So we have a question here from Palage, and that is asking if you could repeat the word that sounded like otolid on how to yeah. tell age. Yeah, that was perfect. It's otolith. So O-T-O-L-I-T-H, otolith. And it's an, an ear bone that basically floats in the fish's ear cavity, and that's what they use to hear. So things bounce off that uh, into receptors in the fish's ear and allows them to hear sounds underwater. Uh, and it just happens to grow because fish grow, as I explained, they grow when the water temperature is good. So they grow a lot in summer and they grow a little bit in winter. Uh, and that creates these, these rings of fast growth and then slow growth. And so if you count those rings, each ring usually represents a year. And we have one last question, Sarah. And that right. is, why are the tags for the fish so expensive? $300? <laughs> Yeah, uh, and some tags can be even more expensive than that uh, because they, you know, what you need to do is create a little computer in that tag that is uh, using the battery and and signaling the radio transmitter to transmit that sound. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of little components and they have to be made really tiny. And the tinier you make things, the more expensive they are. Um, but they have to be made really tiny so that the tag actually fits in the fish without uh, affecting its behavior. Um, it's, it's too bad they're that expensive, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's the reality. Well, it's already been an hour and I know that we have more questions that are coming in online and I wish we had time to get to them all, but, but I did start with one and I think it's an important one for everyone who's watching and what can you do now, whether you're a youth or whether you're an adult, whether you're a teacher, whether you're wherever you are in Canada or across the States. What can you do now to help prevent invasive species or address invasive species that are already in your community? Well, I think the best thing you can do is make sure that you don't uh, release any uh, animals or species that you have. Uh, so if you have any pets, uh, make sure they don't go into the wild. If you can't keep them anymore, uh, find someone else to take them or bring them to an aquarium store or a pet store. Uh, but don't release anything into the wild like that. Um, if you are going from one ecosystem to another, hiking in one forest and then another forest or uh, wading in one stream and then another, uh, or bringing your boat from one lake to another, just make sure you clean off all your gear uh, and do a lot of what you're doing right now to, to stop the spread of COVID, do the same sorts of things to stop the spread of uh, invasive species. Uh, so there's a lot that every person can do to make sure they don't contribute to this. Wonderful. Well, Nick, thank you so much for joining us today. I learned a ton about invasive species and biology and physiology. And I want to thank you for joining and explaining all the wonderful things that you do in your career um, with the CWF. So thank yeah. you everyone for joining from across Canada and um, North America. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye.